So a lot of people have spoken so far about the promise of big data and the way that it's changing things from the point of view that we already have this data and it's having a lot of important effects. Uh, the talk I'm going to give is going to be very slightly different in that I'm going to talk about an area in which we're starting to get big data, or at least big-ish, and we really, really need it. Okay. So I'm a computer scientist, not a biologist. Recently, I've got involved in projects around the general area of global food security. Okay. This is one of the biggest challenges facing the world at the moment. Uh, according to the UN's Farming and Agriculture Organization, around about 800 million people are classed as undernourished at the moment. By 2015, we're going to, 2050, we're going to have a world population that's risen by 34%. We're going to have to feed 9 to 10 billion people. Okay. If we're going to do that, food production is going to have to raise yeah. by 70%. Okay. That would be hard enough in itself, but there are things working against that. Climate change basically means that plants, because most food is tied to plants, have to grow in much harsher environments than they used to, or just more different environments than they used to, things that they haven't adapted to. Okay. We're facing nutrient depletion. Yeah. You see a lot of things, people talking about what will happen when the oil runs out. When the phosphorus runs out, the plants won't grow. Okay. <clears throat> and the amount of land available, partly because of climate change, partly because of increased urbanization, means we have to produce this food using a smaller area of land. Okay. So this is a huge problem, and it's something that's bothering plant scientists, crop scientists, soil scientists, farmers, and needs to bother computer scientists. Okay. So apologies to those who have some training in biology. Classic description of the way a plant appears is the genotype and the environment determine the phenotype. Okay. What that means is the genetic structure of the plant and the environment in which it grows, how much water there is, temperature, etc., yeah. determine its physical characteristics. Okay? The phenotype is a physical description of a plant. Yeah. It could be static, just about its shape, it could be about its growth, it could be about some other aspect of its function, like photosynthesis. Okay? These two effects really determine the way that a phenotype appears. So what this shows is uh, a bunch of Arabidopsis plants, the model uh, plant that was mentioned earlier. Along the top, along the you have five different genotypes. Okay? So each column is a different genetic structure. Yeah? Walking down that each column, each of these plants has been given different amounts of UV light, different amounts of exposure to sun. And it doesn't take a lot to see that the plants themselves are very, very different. Okay? Their phenotypes are very, very different. Okay. Nowadays, analyzing the genetic structure of a plant is comparatively easy. Two or three hundred pounds, you can tell what's actually inside that plant from a genetic point of view. Com measuring and controlling the environment is also pretty easy. We're talking about weather stations, temperature sensors, soil moisture sensors. You can do this comparatively easily too. Okay. So we've reached a point where the biologists have, if you like, two of the three tools that they need. What the biologists and the plant breeders need to be able to do is to be able to look at the phenotype of a plant, the way it behaves, and decide whether this is a good behavior for the, for the current conditions, and then use that particular plant, select from the possible plants available, to breed, yeah, to produce better plants. And in my naive understanding of this, a long time ago, people used to be able to plant a bunch of seeds, watch them grow, yeah. say, this one's this big, this one's this big, we'll have this one. Okay. Because it was a comparatively simple thing to do. It's not simple anymore. Yeah. Now you need to have much finer, more detailed analysis of, of more properties of the plants. Okay. You need to phenotype them. So that's what phenotyping is. It's the process of taking a plant and making a bunch of measurements on it and then deciding what type of plant it is, classifying it in some way, labeling it. But the making of the measurements is the hard part. Okay. So how do you do it? Well, broadly, you take your plant, or plants, you point a load of sensors at them, yeah, that you've carefully designed, 
You then get some data out that you analyze, and from that data you get plant traits. Okay? Height, biomass, average root angle, whatever you think is interesting. Okay? <clears throat> what the biologists care about is taking the traits and mapping that to the genetics and to the environment yeah. and working back yeah, to see what genetic structure, what environment gives them the thing that they want. Okay. We need to do this in all sorts of environments. We need to do this on leaves, on seeds, yeah, on flowers. We need to do it in glass houses. Yeah. We're really behind, the world is really behind, in its ability to do this. If you look at the state of phenotyping versus the state of genotyping, it's very difficult to do. It gets harder, though, because the biologists don't really know, in a lot of cases, what traits they want. And these experiments are very hard to do. If you're developing all these plants that you want to test, it can cost thousands and thousands of pounds to do, and a lot of time. You need to wait for them to grow. Okay. So what you want is data coming out of it that is as useful as possible. Okay. So you want something that isn't just one shot and then your plant's dead and you come back the following week and go, oh no, I really wish I'd measured. Yeah. <clears throat> so you need general flexible sensors. Okay? And you need general flexible sensors that will produce quantitative data yeah. that will do it objectively, which pretty much means being as automated as possible. Okay. And you need it to be what's termed high throughput. We're looking for small changes in complicated organisms, and what you have to do to do that is analyze a lot of plants, hundreds to thousands of plants, okay, and look at the statistics of their traits yeah, to see which are the really important ones. You measure one plant, you might be wrong. It might be an outlier. Okay? So it's quite a tall order. Yeah. Good way to do it is to use images and computer vision. Okay? There are a number of reasons for that. Yeah? Biologists have lots of images. For many years, they've been taking images and they have been analyzing them manually and quantitative, qualitatively. Yeah? So there is some data already there. Yeah? What we need to do now is to capture our images maybe a bit more carefully and find ways of analyzing them to give us the data that we want. Okay? And that's where the computer vision comes in, which for me is the fun bit. Okay. So basic idea of computer vision is to make machines that can, in some sense, see, yeah, that can take images and that can pull information out of those images about the real world. So you might recognize who I am. Yeah? You might recognize that all the floors here are flat and that this is vertical. Yeah? You might uh, watch objects moving through time and track them. Okay? So if I can find my cursor, this is a classic piece of video from Andrew Blake a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> we look at single images, we look at multiple sets of images, and we look at videos, and we try to track moving objects. Okay? So the figure on the left you've probably all seen a version of in your cameras. They will detect faces. People in computer vision try to tell that that's a car, that's a dog, that's a person. They take multiple images of the world in the same way that we have two eyes, and they use them to reconstruct 3D models, like that model of Rick Zaliski in the middle. Okay. And they take sequences of images, and they track them. They say, I think the little girl's head is here in this frame. I think it will move there in the next frame. Let's go and look for it and find it. Oh, there it is now. Let's predict. Okay. So there's a wealth of stuff in here. Hasn't really been applied to plants. Most computer vision work has been done for the manufacturing industry, for the entertainment industry. Um, it varies depending on what's going on over time. It's been done just for pure science as modeling. Plants have been left out, okay? and they've been left out because they're complicated. Okay? If you're looking at a person moving, then that's quite difficult. We can change our shape in all sorts of different ways, but the number of ways we can change our shape is Restricted, yeah? my arm bends here and only here. Okay? A plant will blow in the wind and it will flap around and it will, the whole thing will move and all sorts of yeah? So plants are complicated, yeah? both in their shape and in their movement. But we need to do this. Okay. So <clears throat> there's a lot of work going on at the moment. There are lots of international initiatives um, to get phenotyping going and to develop and make technology available to biologists. 
Um, I thought I would pick one that we've developed in Nottingham and give you an idea of the sort of problems we come up against and the sort of solutions we have and what we're aiming for. Okay. So at Nottingham, we work a lot with root biologists, particularly a guy called Malcolm Bennett. And <coughs> what they want to do is they want to look at the effect of different genetic structures and different environments on root architecture. Okay. The idea is that people have worked an awful lot on the top half of the plant but not so much on the bottom half of the plant because it's harder to actually see what's happening with the roots and so on. Yeah. So maybe there are big gains to be had by focusing on the root. The problem though is that roots grow in soil and you can't see them. There are lots of systems around that grow the roots on artificial media in, in tubs of clear jelly or by sticking them to bits of paper. And that's okay, it tells you something, but you're a step, at least, away from reality. Yeah, but the fields that plants grow in are not made of uniform, nice, smooth jelly that all the roots can push through easily. Okay? If you put um, water in, it doesn't spread evenly across the fields like it does across the jelly it gets in clumps. Yeah? So what you really want is to look at how the roots grow in real soil. Okay? So the approach we've taken at Nottingham is to use uh, X-ray computed tomography. So we're using instruments kind of like a medical x-ray, but uh, generally of much higher resolution. Okay. And with one kind of physical difference that when you have a medical x-ray done of your head, you stand still and the device spins around you. Yeah, imagine a dental x-ray. Okay. And what you have as it spins around is on one side an x-ray emitter and on one side an x-ray detector and the things go through and it makes a measurement. With ours, it's the other way. We have an X-ray gun that's fixed, we have a detector that's fixed, and the plant rotates in the middle. Okay. We fire lots of X-rays through, yeah, many, many projections, depending on how many times we spin the, uh, the plant. And from the measurements we get at the other side, we can uh, reconstruct a three-dimensional image. Right? So it's like a volume of data, three-dimensional grid. Each element of that grid has in it uh, a value, and that value is proportional to the density of the object that you're looking at. Okay? So from our point of view, it's nice. It doesn't mess with the roots. You don't have to dig them up. Okay? It doesn't destroy them or damage them. Yeah. You can therefore do this over time. Yeah? We can scan on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and see what's happened. So it's kind of good. The difficult part is when you come to analyze the images to get the data out that you want. Okay? So this is a, a horizontal slice through one of our 3D images, okay? We have, uh, the plants are grown in cylinders, so you can see the outside of the cylinder, it's round, and all the stuff in the middle is the density from the, uh, from the soil and from the roots, okay? Things that are bright are very, very dense, so there's a couple of really bright stones in there. The black around the outside is the air around the outside of the, of the tube. <coughs> if you want to separate this out into roots and soil, First thing you do is you look at your data. Right? So we took that image and we other images too, and we produced a simple histogram of the, the number of uh, occurrences of each color that can appear in the image in there, and we plotted it. And we thought, wow, this is really good. This is easy. We'll be done by lunchtime. Yeah? We want to find two things. We want to find roots and soil. And there are clearly in here two clusters of, uh, of voxel values, of pixel values. So if we set a threshold in the middle and we say everything to the right of that dip is roots and everything to the left of that dip is soil or vice versa, we've solved it. Then we looked a bit closer. It turns out that that's the soil. It turns out that that is air, just gaps between the soil, and the roots are in there. Okay. <clears throat> so you can't just easily find a number. And it gets worse. What you're seeing here is a little video going down through one of our stacks. And at each, uh, in each frame, we have manually marked up a root. Okay, so you'll see a little red blob appearing to move when it gets back to the beginning. Yeah? Because as you go down, your root grows like this. Yeah? You're sampling it like that. So your little patch of root material will appear to move. Okay? We then plotted the histogram for each of those little root things at each thing and plotted them down the page. And what you see is at the top, yeah. it's very different to in the middle and very different to at the bottom. Yeah. 
The density of the roots actually changes as you go down them, possibly because of age, possibly because of water content, possibly because of the effects of stones and so on. Yeah. So what that means is that if I take the first couple of images and I look at them and I say, this is what root looks like, tell me stuff that looks like that, find me stuff that looks like that everywhere else, then I'm going to get the stuff in this unshaded area yeah. and not in the shaded area. So I'm going to miss all that uh, root material further down to the right, and I'm going to mark all of those voxels with those colors where there is actually no root, there's actually not root material. I'm going to get it wrong. Yeah. And no matter how I do it, if I take a whole stack and train on it, yeah, I'm one root. I'm not going to get it right. If I set my threshold values to be that unshaded area, I will pick up all the root, yeah. but I'll get a lot of false positives. All the bits that are flat, yeah, where there's no root material, will be labeled as root material. The practical effect is if you do that, you get something like that. You can kind of see there's a root in there, yeah. but it's not so good. So we took a different approach. We took the approach of the tracking the little girl's head, and we said, let's view it as a video analysis problem. As we go down the uh, stack, let's take each little root, material, root blob and let's look for it in the next image and then go find it and look for it and go find it and look for it and go find it. Okay. And if you do that, you're focusing on, an, image, on a, an individual root as you go down, which is kind of nice. You're not so distracted by the background. You can make your tracker adaptive so it can learn what the object is looking like as it goes and then look, learn, uh, then look for what it thinks it looks like now. Yeah. And you can put all sorts of information in. Okay, which is kind of nice. You can put in shape, you can put in color, whatever you feel like. Okay. So a quick example of it working. Uh, what you've got here is one of our stacks. We've picked one of the things that we're tracking, and on here you can see it blown up. And this time the red was put on by our uh, software, yeah, by our tracker. And as we go down, yeah. things happen like the roots split because they branch yeah. and they change. Okay. But we can follow them fairly well yeah, through the through the stack. Okay. Okay. So it pretty much works. This is an example of a set of three roots grown in a little tiny pot. Yeah. They're three wheat roots. Whoop, missed my video. Uh, there are three roots in here. They're genetically the same. They're in the same pot. The environment's the same. This is kind of the hardest thing that you can do. Yeah. And they're crammed in. Right? They would never grow this close together naturally, but they're touching each other. So by setting off three trackers at the top of three roots, yeah, we can pull out that description of the roots, and we can actually separate them. Okay. So we have three um, separate roots segmented. Yeah. And what we can do then is we can take that stuff, and we can analyze it, and give the biologist information about each individual root, what its angles are and so on, and also about its uh, relation to its neighbors. Okay. So that's good. We've solved the core problem. But, uh, <clears throat> and then what we do is we take that and we represent it in a formal way. We have to put our stuff into the sorts of databases that we talked about earlier. Yeah. So we need a standard format. So we represent our uh, root architecture as a hierarchical structure with roots and branches, just as you would think, okay? If we asked anybody in the audience to make one of these up, I think you'd come up with something very similar to this. Okay? So we get a structural description of the root, and then the biologists can use that to extract whatever traits they care about, okay? There's one more bit missing, though. We need this to be high throughput, okay? So we need to be able to do a lot of plants. So we need some kind of automation. And what is springing up across the world at the moment, mainly in Europe, yeah, though the Americans are getting started now, uh, mainly in Europe are almost plant analysis factories. Yeah. You see a number of things where there are lots of uh, plants on conveyor belts moving around a, a warehouse, being watered, yeah, being appropriately lit, going into an image station, having a bunch of images taken. Yeah. And trait data extracted and put into a database. So we needed to build one of those. Okay? It was technically, from an engineering point of view, a little bit tricky for us because we want to grow uh, real crop plants, this is wheat, I think, um, in real field soil. Right? So real crop plants have very long roots, right? and they grow very big, about two meters of mature wheat plant. So 
So we're looking at big things okay. and heavy things. So what we did was we have created a thing called the Hounsfield facility. Um, I'll run the video in a second. What the Hounsfield facility basically is, is a, an industrial unit with three X-ray machines in, next to a glass house that's connected. Yeah. Uh, and there's a link between the two, and you'll see the link in a second. Okay. And in the glass house, we, we grow our plants in what we call soil columns, but which are actually, that's not my video, uh, but they're actually bits of uh, drain pipe. So this is a camera mounted on our mobile robot. <coughs> Sorry, so it's a camera mounted on one of the soil columns, and it shows what happens to it. So they sit in the glass house, a mobile comes along, picks them up, takes them to the scanner, big robot arm puts them in the scanner, they then get scanned. So this is a room-sized scanner, and it's spinning around on the X-ray plate. Yeah. Uh, this is a room-sized scanner that will handle things up to about a meter and a half. Uh, if you can move the thing on the side. Yeah. <coughs> and then it gets taken out again. We need automation of that kind of power to deal with the weight. Okay? These columns cost uh, weigh around 80 to 100 kilograms, and you can just move them manually. Um, but you really, really don't want to drop one into your million-pound scanner if you can possibly help it. Okay? And then it gets taken back by the robot and put back in a place that's decided upon beforehand. So we have about 140 columns in the facility. It's completely automated. Okay? We can set it going and program it up to do an experiment. So there's an interface that allows you to say, do this, this one, this one on Monday, this one on Tuesday, this one on Wednesday, and it will execute your thing 24-7. Yeah. The robots take stuff to the scanner, it gets scanned, it goes through our software, it gets segmented. Yeah. When the routes are pulled out, they're described in that standard structure in root system markup language, or RSML, so we have a standard stuff, and it goes in the database. Okay. This is an example. Okay. Um, we have other root, for, uh, root phenotyping things we've developed. We have shoot phenotyping things we've developed. Uh, there are people across uh, Germany, France, Italy, um, building these types of things and operating them and looking at getting them to a point where we can provide the biologists with the big data that they need. Yeah. Um, it's grown immensely in the past three to four years. Okay. There are now plant phenotyping initiatives in the UK, Germany, France. There's a European one. There's an international one. Uh, there's a Canadian national project I was at a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was a meeting at the same time to set up a North American phenotyping initiative. Um, at, it's getting to be a big thing. Okay. It's getting to be a big thing because we need it. Right? Food security is a real problem. Okay. And we have lots of data on the genetic side, but without the, the data on the uh, phenotyping side, we can't make the most of it. Okay? So plant phenotyping is the bottleneck now. Yeah. Good ways of measuring this stuff. Is, yeah. Computer vision has come up just to be an a, a good way of doing it, just because it fits. Okay? The biologists really are not sure what they want. As I said earlier, it's a very fragmented discipline. If I line three biologists up and I ask them what root traits they're interested in, depending on what they're working on, they'll probably say different things. Yeah. And if I ask them next month, they'll say something else. Okay. So by taking the approach of building kind of generic structures, kind of 3D models of objects that you can extract stuff from, we're trying to dampen that effect down a little bit. Okay. Uh, but there are lots of other things around where c the computer vision stuff is very application specific. Okay? Can I measure the amount of disease of a particular type on the leaf of a particular type of plant? So there's all sorts of things being going on. What we've done is just one example. Okay? Uh, so there are lots of unsolved problems. Yeah? There are lots of people working on it. Uh, but that's good because we need to work on it and we haven't got much time. So it's coming and with a bit of luck, uh, in the future, not too distant future, a lot more glass houses will be populated by these kinds of people. Thank you.